Hi everyone, this is Mel White, and, and on behalf of Classic Exhibits, thank you for, for participating in the Sharpen Your Skills webinars. First, I'd really like to commend everyone who's out there for attending today, and it means that you recognize that face-to-face -face will likely evolve post-quarantine. And as I'm talking to folks out there, we all know people who are sticking their head in the sand, pretending that nothing will change, and then there are those who are the chicken little folks who are convinced the sky is falling, when in fact, neither is true. And I'm gonna give you an example. Do you remember when fast food restaurants were required to put calories on the menu? Experts, and I'm putting that in air quotes, predicted the demise of McDonald's and Taco Bell that people wouldn't eat there anymore once they knew how many calories were in the food. But that didn't happen because, you know, we want what we want. And trade shows and face-to-face -face meetings of all kinds are no different. We are fortunate to have Emily Barta with us today. Emily has specialized in in-person and virtual events for over 20 years. She's been a presenter, a virtual and hybrid event host, an MC, and of course, an event planner for companies like Honeywell, Thrivent Financial, and Carnival Cruise Line. If you haven't seen Emily in action, I encourage you to visit her website, emilybarta.com. There's really lots of cool information there. Emily, would you like to say a few words before I describe today's webinar format? Well, I would like to say welcome and hello. Everybody that's joining us today, we really appreciate that you're here. We are here for you, and we are hoping that we help some of these really confusing things out there make sense. So welcome, enjoy. We asked for questions in advance, which many of you were kind enough to submit. Emily will respond to those first, after that, she'll answer your questions, um, and we need you to submit those in the question panel. Feel free to enter those questions at any time during the webinar, but we'll get to those at the very end. As we reviewed the attendee list for today, we have a diverse group of people here across, not only within the trade show industry, but in users and suppliers and others. Um, and while not every question may fit your exact situation, I promise you that the information today will be very beneficial. Hey, for your money back, right? Emily, if you're ready, shall we begin? I'm ready, let's go. Question number one. I keep hearing online events called different names. Are virtual events, digital events, and hybrid events the same thing? Well, thank you, Yvonne, for that question. Unfortunately, life is confusing enough right now. Why do we have to call things different names? An online event, a virtual event, and a digital event is the same thing. They are any event that is held online where all audience members are participating remotely. The difference is a hybrid event. Now, a hybrid event is an in-person event and a virtual event happening simultaneously and they enable two audiences to participate as one. Unfortunately, right now, with all of the stay-at-home orders and all of the travel restrictions and the fact that in-person events are canceled, hybrid events cannot happen right now. But when things get back to normal or the new normal, we will be able to do hybrid events then. Second question. I have received over 20 emails from tech vendors that I have never heard of. How do I know which is the best for my virtual event. Well, Tom, please do not start with the tech. Please start with the strategy. The short answer is the best tech vendor for your event is whichever enables the best experience for your virtual audience based on strategic objectives, audience demographics, and logistics. So, for example, strategic objective. We need to start with the why. Why are we holding this event? We need to figure out who are we holding it for? We need to figure out what are we going to say? And we need to figure out how are we going to say it? We need to figure out all of this first. The virtual platform is the where in the scenario. I liken virtual platforms to in-person venues. So much like a meeting planner, or a trade show planner will go do site visits to find the perfect venue for the event that they're planning, you need to check out all of these different virtual event platforms and do a site visit to figure out which one is best for your event. 
with regard to audience demographics, you need to think of the people in your audience. It doesn't matter what you like, what your technology aptitude is, you know, how you want to do this. It matters how your virtual audience will best receive it. So think about them. What is their technology aptitude? How do they prefer to receive the content? How do they like to communicate? They may have more understanding and comfort with technology than you, but they quite possibly might have less. less. So definitely keep this into consideration. And when it comes to logistics, these are all of the picky little questions that you need to know the answer to before you ever have a meeting with a virtual platform provider. So think about how many audience members are there going to be? Is the platform scalable? If you are doing any sort of confidential or proprietary information, what sort of security measures are in place? Are you going to be doing a single stream or are you going to be doing multiple concurrent streams? How does the interface look? Is it visually appealing? Is it easy to use? That's for your virtual audience. For you as the organizer, how does it work on the back end? Is the registration included or do you need to do this through a different provider? Is the virtual event able to be recorded? If it's recorded, what kind of editing, storage, and on-demand viewing options are there? And then what about the virtual event a meeting with a virtual platform provider? All right, thank you, Emily. Next question. Since in-person events have always been about learning and networking, how do I go about getting my attendees to interact and actually network with one another at a virtual event? Well, Stacia, thank you for asking this question because audience engagement is one of my loves. Um, I've actually come up with three ways to do this. Number one, you need to design the virtual audience experience for them, not you. Number two, you need to teach them how to use the technology. And number three, I am unfortunately having to say, you need to hold their hand and you need to continually encourage them to participate during the event. So when it comes to designing the virtual audience experience, you know, look at all of the options that the platform provides or that you can find off platform that would provide that engagement and that interaction between the speakers and the audience, as well as amongst the audience members. You know, are there, can you do informal chats? Can you do moderated chats? Are there games? Are there polls? Are there contests? Really look at all the different ways to engage that virtual audience and pick the ones that your virtual audience will enjoy doing the most and, and quite honestly want to participate in. In terms of teaching them how to use the technology, you have to do this before the show. So guess what? That means you have more opportunities for pre-show marketing. In teaching them how to use the technology, in teaching them how to get engaged, in teaching them how to experience the event that you're planning, you could do explainer videos that you send out before the event. You can create a welcome video at the beginning of the event that helps explain and teach everybody what to do. You can do a rotating slide deck loop that is providing nuggets of information that you're playing while people are joining the event. You can do pre-printed and mailed guidebooks because everybody loves getting things in the mail. And quite honestly, right now, that's about as different as we can get from what we're dealing with every day. So again, look at your audience demographics. How do they wish to receive communication? And find a variety of options to teach them how to do this beforehand. During the event, you need to hold their hand and you need to continually encourage them to participate. So I always recommend hosts and moderators for every single engagement tactic you are pulling into place. If you are offering an opportunity for engagement, you need to have somebody on your team there to moderate it and encourage it. These team members need to play matchmaker. They need to foster connections. And they can't just do it once in the beginning. They have to continually do it throughout the entire event. So there are ways to engage your audience um, when you're planning them. I've got three rules of engagement. Number one, know your audience. Number two, give your audience what they want. And rule number three, give your audience what they want in the way they wish to receive it.
Next question. As a small company that focuses on designing and building exhibits and environments, what are some of the things we can do to keep our employees and contractors working? We need to keep everybody working as much as they possibly can. And right now, everybody and every company who has closed doors or who is unemployed needs to take a look at their expertise and figure out how to do it differently. So I think that there are three things that we can do. Um, number one, we can pivot to medical. Now, I completely am aware that this has been going on for a minimum of four weeks now, and you may already be doing this, or you may already be bidding on this. But my advice is try to anticipate the next opportunity, because what you're doing today, you will not be doing tomorrow, you will not be doing next month, you will not be doing next week. Needs are gonna to continue to change. My guess is through the end of the year. The medical expert, experts are anticipating a resurgence of COVID-19 in the fall or winter. So as event professionals and exhibit providers, we need to stay ahead and we need to figure out what is coming next. What it looks like is Local shops, local restaurants, local gyms are going to be opening up in communities, but there's going to be guidelines and restrictions. So can you go out into your community and can you offer safety measures for both their employees and their customers, whether it is hand sanitizing stations, whether it is hand washing stations, whether it is stanchions for crowd control, or partitions to create a physical space between people. You know, go out into your community, figure out things you can do to provide, and then educate people on the fact that they need them and that you can provide them. And then next, offices are gonna go, going to be opened, and people are gonna go back to work. So again, take what I just said, but translate it into the office space. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever your work style, a lot of offices have transitioned into an open workspace environment. So how can you help these offices temporarily create separation until they can permanently redesign their office? Or can you help them permanently redesign their office? Can you put, again, sanitation stations or um, can you do hand washing stations? If I just came in from, a, if I'm walking back to my restaurant after lunch, I'm sorry, if I'm walking back to my office from a restaurant after lunch, and I touched a variety of surfaces along the way, hand railings, elevator buttons, door handles, I might want to wash my hands before I go back to my desk, but I might not want to have to walk into the restroom to do so. So think about how people move about society, what they're touching, where they're coming from, where they're going to, and how you can help keep them safe in between. The second thing that we can do is pivot to virtual events. Now, this is very confusing. There is no one way, there is no right answer. What I am seeing out there in social media and via email is there are a lot of companies that are saying that they offer virtual events or virtual experiences. But what does that mean? So my challenge to you is think about ways that you can support planning and producing and broadcasting virtual events. Be very, very specific about what you offer and put together packages based on your expertise. I would recommend taking what you know and pivoting, pivoting it to help, as opposed to trying to go run out right now and learn everything there is to know within the next two weeks. Or figure out a virtual event experience or package you wanna be able to offer to your clients and get all of the necessary pieces and people in place before you ever have those conversations. Um, when I'm working on virtual and hybrid events, I am looking at building a set. And whether the set is in my home, 
this set is in my office or this set is on a trade show floor, I am always concerned about what the virtual audience is seeing in the background. And this is where you are the expert. You know how to create a backdrop. You know how to create a step and repeat. You know how to take banner stands and repurpose them to create a pleasing backdrop that covers up things that take away focus. You probably know production. So think about camera lighting and sound packages. Can you put together a work from home video conference camera light sound package that you can rent or sell to your clients? When your clients go back into the office, can you take a conference room and retool it into a broadcast studio? Yes, you can, you know how to do this. You can set up your exhibit in your warehouse and you can do a virtual tour or you can set up the entire exhibit or parts of the exhibit in your warehouse to create a set for your clients when they are able to travel and you can do an entire broadcast you know right there from your warehouse you can assist with the elements of hybrid events when we get back to trade shows when i do a hybrid event at a trade show i am counting on the exhibit house to provide me the necessary components to put it together so really think this through you're already designing and building the booth. So now we want to put in not only a presentation area, but a broadcast area. So what does that need? That needs a backdrop that cannot be shiny and cannot have scenes. You know, that needs branded podiums that are there to assist the presenters, the hosts, the products without having shiny surfaces, without having branding being cut off in the camera field, so on and so forth. So you can do it now, and you can do it when we get back to the office, and you can do it when we get on the show floor. But I really challenge you to take your expertise and start there. And nobody knows what you can do with regard to virtual events if you haven't already done it. So figure out what you can provide, put it in a package, and start marketing it to your clients. The third thing that you can do is pivot to other marketing methods. And what I mean by this is both you and your clients need to continue marketing to stay top of mind. The companies that are going to make it through this in some ways, because obviously there's a lot of variables going on now, are the ones that are gonna continue marketing and continue staying top of mind so that everybody knows that they're there when the time is right. So what can you do to assist? You can help them create content for landing pages and other sales tools because salespeople are not able to go into their customer's office, workshop, factory, and do those one-on-one -on -one product demos. So what kind of sales tools can you assist your clients in creating? You can put together welcome gifts, thank you gifts, branded promo items, and mail it to customers. If you have a client that's doing a virtual event right now, one of the ways to engage that audience is to send them something. Much like on the trade show floor, we have our branded promotional items, and we usually have several layers of them. We have the ones that we give to everybody and to the looky-loos. We give ones to people who have participated in an in-booth presentation as a thank you for their time. We have a higher level for people who then went from the in-booth presentation into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a company employee. We have one for VIPs, and a lot of times we do contests where we scan badges on the trade show floor and do a drawing after the show. All of that can be done through the mail. And if your client needs to do 200 packages and each package, the cardboard box, some printed collateral, some packing supplies, and three promotional items, then it needs to be addressed and then it needs to be mailed. And that client's working from home. Chances are they don't want this set up in the kitchen, but you can set it up in your warehouse and you can do this for them. Um, I always say that when it comes to 
virtual and hybrid events. You are planning an event, but you are producing a broadcast. So during that broadcast, let's take what we know on the trade show floor and flip it to through the camera. You can create branded shirts, sweaters, vests, and hats for your customers to wear during their virtual events, much like you provide them booth uniform on the trade show floor. You can provide them mugs or water bottles or pens that are branded. Anything that that virtual audience will see on the screen, you can provide those presenters to have with them. When we get to go back to trade shows, please capture content at the show. Encourage your clients to capture content. It can be videos, it can be podcasts, it can be live streams, it can be photographs. Just capture content at the show and repurpose it afterwards to keep the conversation and the sales process moving forward. Because I really believe that when we get to go back to trade shows, the attendance is going to be a little bit lower than it has been in the past, either because an individual doesn't feel comfortable traveling or a company is putting traveling restrictions on their employees. So whatever we do on the trade show floor, we need to capture it and we need to get it out to those that are not able to attend. So there's a lot of things that we can do. We just need to take our strengths and we need to figure out what we can do with them now, tomorrow, and then when we get back to trade shows. All right. How do we assess and guide our clients during this time? Although we're seeing some shows rescheduled for August and September, we're already assuming that shows will continue to be pushed out and even canceled through the fall. Obviously, this impacts exhibit houses tremendously. And so far, it doesn't appear that many of our clients are moving to virtual trade show experiences. What are some alternative options? Well, Jennifer, in terms of advising and gui guiding your clients during these times, the first thing I recommend is talking to them and educating them on what a virtual event really is and the fact that it doesn't have to be complicated. What we are doing right now is a virtual event, and it is so for three reasons. Number one, it is a gathering of an audience. Number two, it is happening in real time. And number three, very shortly and you know prior to us starting today it includes interaction amongst all who are participating i see all over social media and from the people that call me they are trying to throw anything against the wall and see what sticks they are trying to take their nine concurrent sessions over the course of 10 hours over the course of six days and put every single thing online I do not recommend that. I recommend first we start with the education that a virtual event does not have to be overly complicated. Trade show managers and event planners are really struggling right now. They know how to plan in-person events, but they don't know how to plan a virtual event. Or if they do, and if they have an idea, they don't necessarily know how to implement it. So, you know, be a calming resource to your clients listen to their needs, offer advice, and if you don't know the answer, search through your database for the person that does. We are all in this together right now. We are all trying to stay employed. We are all trying to do events. So I really believe that everybody is in this together. I think we need to take each component of the trade show booth and rethink how to use it in a virtual environment. So if you are doing a product demo at a kiosk on a trade show floor, how can that be flipped and done online? If you're doing an in-booth presentation on the trade show floor, how can that be flipped and done online? It doesn't have to be all day. It doesn't have to be all hour. You know, it could be as short as 10 or 15 minutes. What we need to do is connect with our audience in any way that we possibly can. And then in terms of what's happening next, I read several articles that suggest that prior to the return of large conferences and trade shows, we might be able to do, and the only option 
might be small local events. So already think ahead. You know, right now we are virtual. The next step might be that we have small gatherings. The next step might be that we can return to trade shows, but they're not as heavily attended. So how can we take content in the booth and provide it to the audience and able to attend? And then the last and final step, the step that we can't wait to get back to, is well, we get to go to trade shows and we get to focus our attention on the person who's standing right in front of us. A follow-up. Are there other opportunities than virtual trade shows for clients who are not doing in-person events? There are so many opportunities, Jennifer, and I know somebody out there is not going to be happy that I said this, but quite honestly, virtual trade shows are my absolute least favorite way to connect with customers virtually. And the reason why is because they try to replicate trade shows, but it is absolutely not possible. Um, my example is Stonehenge. I got to visit Stonehenge. I got to stand in the middle of those stones. I'm dating myself as to when I was able to do this because you can't do that anymore. But I was able to go to Stonehenge. I was able to stand in the middle of the stones. I could feel the history. I could stare at this amazing engineering feat. And I had an experience that can absolutely never be replicated in any other way than being there in person. When I look at my pictures of Stonehenge, all those feelings and all those emotions come back. And that is why trade shows cannot be replicated online. But what can be done online is rethinking in-person marketing events digitally. So you can do a virtual booth tour. You can do a virtual product launch or a virtual product demo. You could do a virtual lunch and learn and actually send people, you know, snacks and drinks in the mail, you know, so that they can eat and drink along with you while they're learning. You can do a virtual moderated panel discussion or a virtual moderated roundtable discussion. Um, and I do emphasize moderated because it's even more so important virtually to have that leader and that person to run the show and keep the conversation on track. You could do a virtual Q&A, kind of like we're doing right now. You could do virtual press conference. You could even do virtual conference room meetings, you know, much like you would do in somebody's office, only you're doing it over the computer. Now, we have to focus on doing these things from home. Soon, we'll be able to focus on doing these things from the office, and eventually, we'll be able to focus on doing these things from the trade show booth. I have watched a lot of Zooms and webinars the last four weeks. Yes, we all have. Why does it look like the presenters are staring off into space? It looks weird. It really does look weird, Scott. And the frustrating thing is I'm seeing it on national news. I'm seeing it on national talk shows. I'm seeing it on local news. It's a really simple answer. They're not looking at the camera. And that is why it looks like they are staring off into space. And it's, it's uncomfortable. You know, when you are doing a Zoom, unless if you are several feet away you cannot look at the person that you are having the conversation with. You have to look at the camera. So if it looks like somebody is looking up, that means that their webcam is on the bottom of their computer and they're not looking at the webcam, they're looking at the person on the screen. If it looks like they are looking down, that means the webcam is on top of their computer and they are looking down at the screen to make what they think is eye contact with the other person. So 
whenever you have to do anything, whether it's a Zoom, a video conference, a webinar, a virtual event, please look at the camera, not the person's image on the screen. Emily, can I ask you a question on that? Do you think part of it is because we use phones and we use the, the laptops that some of us just don't know where the camera is? Yes, that could absolutely be the case. We don't know where the camera is. Or it could be that we've never had to use the camera before, so we don't know proper camera skills. It could be that we are distracted and we're trying to do multiple things at once, and so we don't remember to look at the camera. Um, and I think a lot of times people are on laptops, and it's a very, very, very small hole. So it's easy to miss and it's easy to forget about. All right, next question. What do you think is the worst thing that could happen during a virtual event, and how do we prepare for it? Well, my answer now is different from my answer 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, I would say that the worst thing that could happen during a virtual event is that you lose the feed. Today, unfortunately, I think the worst thing that could happen during a virtual event is that you get hacked. So. Losing the feed is still a problem today. Almost every single virtual or hybrid event that I have ever been involved in lost their feed for a minimum of five seconds or greater. Now, the way to accommodate this is to always have a backup plan in place. Share that backup plan with your audience prior to the event as well as during the event and make sure that that backup plan happens off platform so that you have that alternate communication source with your audience. Once the feed resumes, I have a three-step process. Number one, you acknowledge. Number two, you apologize. And number three, you move on because the show must go on. Today, we're having a lot of problem with hackers and we're having a lot of problems with security. Um, Zoom bombing. I mean, we're like inventing words as they happen. This is a serious problem now, and they are looking at how to prevent this problem from happening. Because you can't solve hackers. You can just prevent them from hacking, and then if they do hack, you can figure out ways to get them off. So before you get into your virtual event, Make sure that you are secure and you have a variety of plans in place to lock down, close, secure that event. And anticipate the worst at all times. That's what we need to do in events. So have that backup plan there just in case. If you get hacked, if you get Zoom bombed, how can you get them off your feet? Well, unfortunately, my backup plan, Emily, is um, to have my classic colleagues text me that I'm screwing something up during the, during the webinar, like the audio in the beginning. But I'm glad they were out there and we were able to get it corrected. All right. But so, see, that's a perfect example. You had a backup plan in place and the problem was solved. Yes. All right. So let's um, – I want to address your questions. And for, for, the, for those of you out there, please – write your questions in the question panel. We've already got a couple already. So let me, let me kind of ask um, a couple of those questions now. Let me get to them just a second. Uh, let me get to it. Um, I, found that, I found that moderators should be key in the success of events, and I've, I've attended. Is there any resource for training hosts and moderators, both for general skills as well as skills specialized to a particular platform? And who asked this question? Jen asked the question. Jen. Okay. So, and, and I, as Mel was asking, I was trying to scroll through and find it, but unfortunately, it is very small. So, if I understood correctly, moderators are key, but how do we train them? What is a resource to train them? Is that correct? If that is what you're asking, um, resources to train moderators. Um, you and you can find articles, you can find YouTube videos, you can look at case studies, and you can take that information and you can adjust it to your particular moderator. The second thing that you can do is hire somebody um, to provide that moderator training. 
Um, there are companies, there are independent contractors out there that do provide moderator training, I being one of them. Some people have packages and courses that they teach. Other people do more custom, individualized training. So there are resources out there. Um, the other thing that you can do is participate in virtual events and watch and learn from the moderators that are there. Oftentimes, I believe that figuring out what you don't like is just as important as figuring out what you do like. All right. What if a client show is going virtual? How can we, as an exhibit company, help them? Well, I hope I've answered this question already. Um, and is it that the trade show is going? Yeah, Carla is asking that question. Is there so, clarification? I'm sorry? Yes, the trade show is what Carla is asking. Okay, so the trade show is going virtual. What can they do to help their clients? Traditionally, when an organizer turns a trade show virtual, what they're doing is they're selling virtual booth space. Unfortunately, the majority of the time, that virtual booth space is nothing more than a landing page where you can insert content. My hope would be that there would be a way to do interaction between the exhibitor and the attendee. So the first thing you need to do is find out from the show organizer what opportunities are available. The second thing that you need to do is, if it is a static landing page, help your client create the most engaging content they can to put into that static landing page. And if video is part of it, go back to what I said about creating that branded backdrop, either with banner stands or step and repeats or backdrops. You know, get the branded podium if they're actually going to be having products or laptops in front of them. Get them in that branded company shirt, branded pen, branded mug, what have you. If they're able, to do that live interaction, work with them on everything I just said in terms of building the set, and then work with them on the production in terms of the camera, the lighting, and the sound. Work with them on the content that they're going to provide. Work with them on scripting that presentation. Work with them on rehearsing that presentation. You know, take it a step further to the technology. What can they do in their home to make sure that the feed is as clear as possible. Um, and then if it is anything more than the static landing page or those live interactions, that is amazing. And I've probably not really seen it done much before. Um, so again, take your expertise. Take what you know. Take what you have already been doing for your customers and alter it to where that is coming from, either coming from home or coming from the office. Um, Emily, how do you feel about taking polls during the, the virtual event itself as far as to keep the audience engaged? This is kind of a, a question suggestion from Carla. Sure, Carla. I do agree with doing polls, provided your virtual audience will participate in them. If you think it's a great idea to have a poll and only 9% of your audience responds, that's not a successful communication method. If you take a poll and I would say 75% or greater of your audience participates, that is a successful tool. So you might not know that going into it and that's perfectly acceptable. So try it out, do a poll, before the event begins or do a poll within a first five minutes and you know tell everybody you're doing the poll make the poll very easy to understand and to take part in you know give them a timeline you know 
we need your answer within the next 45 seconds and we're going to let you know how you all feel. And then look at the results on the back end. You are going to be able to see how many people answered. And if it's a low amount, you don't do anymore. If it's a high amount, you do the rest of them that you have planned. Polls are a great way to not only keep the virtual audience engaged, but also provide the planner valuable information, whether it be demographic, whether it be wants and needs, whether it be problem solution oriented. I do like polls, provided that they're a good fit for your audience. All right, this may be a difficult question to answer in specifically, but is what is the cost difference between an in-person trade show or event and producing a professional virtual event? It's absolutely not a number that there's any algorithm to say. Um, just like building a 10 by 10 booth costs different than building a 40 by 40 booth, you know, planning a virtual event has so many different variables. And I'm not just looking at size and I'm not just looking at scale. I'm looking at that, everything that you put into it. You could conceivably do a 10 by 10 booth and put tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff inside those 100 square feet, which would then cost more than a bigger booth with less stuff in it. So there, there's just no comparison. When it comes to virtual events, the more pieces to the puzzle that you add, the more team members that you add, the longer it is, the more concurrent sessions you do. It makes the price higher and higher. But just like doing a trade show booth, you gotta look at the ROI, you know, and I always recommend starting small rather than starting big. In some ways, they could be perceived as being less expensive because there's no travel involved, but sometimes the cheap virtual events that I see look really bad and provide a very bad digital reputation point for the, the customer. I just, the example that I have is, I, had a, I have a friend who is a CMO, and he sent me this video. It was a Zoom recording, and he goes, oh, my gosh, you have to watch it. This CMO is amazing, and I couldn't get two minutes into it, and I don't know this man, and I mean no disrespect to this man, but he was a mess. He was a mess. His background was a mess. His communication skills were a mess. His Zoom skills were a mess. His camera skills for, were a mess. I couldn't get two minutes into it. So take that example and, you know, transition it for your clients. I would rather them do something for 10 minutes that was perfect than 10 hours that was a mess because the 10 minutes of perfection provides the better ROI. Well, Emily, th Emily, thank you for using me as an example. I appreciate it. That was not you. <laughs> All right. I've, I've, I've got a question for Tony, and it's, and it's really a question for the group. And he said, has anyone actually had a client interested in hosting a virtual event with their exhibit company um, or elements of their exhibit so far? So if people want to respond to that for Tony, I think that's a great question where there's a lot of conversations about virtual and hybrid events, but are your clients actually asking you to do that? And um, Carla says yes um, out there. So anybody else? Has anybody else has any have any clients who are asking them to host a virtual event for them? Yep, there's another. Chuck is saying yes. So, uh, so apparently there is the clients are asking for um, for them to do that. So there is a demand. So it sounds like there is um, people want to head that direction at least to some extent, and there is a chance to make money there. So then I have a follow up question to that, if I may, Mel. For those of you who have clients that are asking you to do virtual events. What are they asking you to do? I mean, are they asking you to start from square one, 
do the strategic goals and objectives, figure out the audience demographics, pick the platform, design the agenda, design the content, do all the scripting, get the speakers involved, input all of their collateral. I, I mean, there are, there are a lot of steps in the process. So my follow-up question would be, what are they asking you to do? Because if they're asking you to provide the platform, that's not your strength. So what I would recommend is if they're asking you to provide the platform, work with them, how I mentioned strategically, about figuring out the audience demographics, the logistics, and the strategic objectives. And then work with them on the site visits of the platforms and work with them to pick the perfect one. After you pick the perfect one, work with them to manipulate it and work with them to put together the engaging content, put together the virtual audience engagement, and put together all of those broadcast elements that we talked about in terms of production and set design. Perfect. Um, Emily, I think that's all the questions. So I'm going to move to the next slide and I'm going to give you kind of a chance to, to talk about contacting you before I wrap things up. Oh, well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope that we provided you some valuable information. I hope that we helped make things make sense. Um, I, like you, am an event professional who is currently unemployed. <laughs> so um, the ways that we can work together is I can be a resource for you. I can be a resource for your clients. I provide hourly Ask Emily Anything consultations. I provide assistance in the planning and design process of the virtual or hybrid event. And I act as the virtual host or the virtual MC during the event. That's now in the future hybrid events and back to trade show in booth presentations. Um, if you want to connect and put me in your Rolodex to use me as a resource, connect with me on LinkedIn and mention that you were part of this webinar so I know where you're coming from. And I love Twitter, I love sharing information. So if you want to see, uh, information if you want to use my twitter feed as your internet search um you know i put valuable information out there about trade shows and virtual events and hybrid events and all things events in general all right thank you emily you did a great job today and i want to thank everyone who participated i appreciate us all staying engaged during the um, quarantine the lockdown w there are some more webinars coming up um, and look for those notices. The, there's going to be one with display supply and lighting about electrical and the changes in the electrical industry within the, the trade shows. There's also going to be a symphony Q&A. We had one um, last week and it went so well. We had so many people who, who attended and a lot of people who reached out and said um, that they had signed up for it but couldn't make it for that one. So we've rescheduled that one. I believe that one is on May 6th. Um, and look for that notification as well. So again, thank you very much, Emily, and thanks to everyone who attended today. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye.